can enhance a believer's understanding in the utter grandeur of God's creation. And we are part of that. So I want to show you this. I am not mixing science and religion. I will not give you lousy evolutionary science. I am going to give you rock solid evolution. Not from the intelligent design pseudoscientific stance. Not from the scientific creationist utterly inane non-scientific stance of a young earth and dinosaurs and humans will live together and all that stupid noise that both the geology record and the fossil record completely refute. I'm going to give you evolution as it is. And I'm going to show how that does not lead to atheism. That is not a necessary conclusion. Truly. Now, from the Mormon end of things is Trent D. Stephens and Jeffrey Meldrum, Evolution and Mormonism, A Quest for Understanding. Now, the thing I love about Stephens and Meldrum's book is they really do give you rock-solid science and rock-solid evolution. They don't hold back. They don't give you the mamby-pamby, weenie arguments, as I like to call them, against evolution. Oh, no. No, they're both biologists, and they understand the central power and use of evolution in science. Too many times we have gotten to the point to where we don't trust science. Or we don't trust the scientists. We have this lingering suspicion that they just don't have the final word and so we can't quite trust them and we have to stick with only the scriptures and only what the church leaders teach. When the scriptures actually do teach us in the Doctrine and Covenants that we should seek out the best books. Books of knowledge, books of geology, books of history. History. Natural history. That's evolution, folks. We have LBS scientists. Henry B. Eyring, Nels B. Nelson back in the early 1900s, B.H. Uh, Roberts, James E. Talmadge, John A. Witso. We have the capability to comprehend modern revelation and our understanding in the plan of salvation and not be opposed to evolution. We don't have to be. In fact, we shouldn't be. Henry B. Eyring wasn't. And he was a world-class scientist. So I want to share some ideas on this idea of how does this how does this uh, how does this help us understand our relationship with God? How does it help us understand our relationship with this world? Is there really a plan? Now see, if you say that God has a plan, you are thinking teleologically. But it has been shown that evolution has no plan. It has no direction. So that seems like a blatant contradiction. And it is if you accept those definitions that are actually based on assumptions. Now, in one of my earlier tapes I said that we can only, our strongest arguments are only based on our strongest assumptions. I said that backwards. I meant to say our strongest arguments are only based upon our weakest assumptions. The assumption is if evolution has no direction, if evolution has no purpose, and yet it is the absolute basis of all of the life sciences. It is the absolute basis, the glue that holds all sciences together. And it has been confirmed again and again and again. And Stephens and Meldrum show this very powerfully. They hold nothing back. Then this leaves no room for God. That's simply false. I don't accept that. There's no reason to. 
None. And I'll explain that. On the Christian side of things, my absolute favorite text is Kenneth R. Miller's Finding Darwin's God. He shows using the laws of science, based upon the laws of science, the pure power, the logic, the compelling evidence, and the arguments in favor of evolution, evolution is solidly supported. The more science learns, the less room there is for God. That's the assumption that Miller destroys. Miller shows how God is using evolution from a believer's perspective. That's not science. That's a believer's perspective, a faith perspective. The science of evolution, or the science of science, never puts God into the equation. Einstein never put God in any of his, his equations. E equals mc squared was energy, mass, and the velocity of light squared with the equals mathematical sign. He nowhere put God in those equations. There is never an invocation of deity when a problem in science is not understood. Now that's what intelligent design wants us to do. As good science, evolution has never had to do that. And it's stronger for it. Because it is based on the natural world. Not the supernatural, the natural. We have to get this. So I want to show you some of Ken Miller's astonishing, powerful, logical, scientific reasons why evolution does not equal atheism. There is a proper understanding of the relationship as well as the interrelationship between evolution and religion. And it's a beauty. It's something else. Now, in Stephen Jay Gould's magnum opus, The Structure of Evolutionary Theory, he has a very delightful, this is, uh, this is his last big magnum opus that he wrote, the uh, Harvard University Press for 2002, on page 260. He's actually been exploring some very remarkably interesting parallels between William Paley's argument for the divine watchmaker and Darwin's argument in favor of natural selection and evolution. And his analysis is extremely good. 